All right, guys. Let's get started. So you probably all know that, or some of you may know. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Doesn't get better than that. Bye, guys. Uh, I mean, you all know, like, you know, you have like three months prepared presentation. You're like, okay, I'm gonna work, to put so much effort into it, and then like one day before, it's like, oh, free. I think I have something that uh, is gonna be helpful for you guys. Um, something that's gonna really show the big picture behind this, um, behind this. Should I get closer? Okay. Um, but let's see. Let's see how this goes, right? Interesting. It's gonna be interesting. Um, so the idea is to show the big picture of this whole project, to really um, share some understanding of what we have in mind. But it kind of turned out to be more, I guess, like how I see things, right? <laughs> so it's not like this is like an official uh, approved design or something, and there's lots of my own thoughts in this presentation. Um, so let's, let's have a look and see how this goes. Um, because it's quite a bit, of course, like this iceberg thing, right? And You've all seen the memes of the iceberg, uh, uh, the iceberg uh, thing. Um, it's really like th what the user actually sees is really just the bare minimum. And what we currently also have in Blender is like has like three percent of what I want to see in Blender eventually, right? It's n so not there yet, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about this kind of stuff. Uh, but it's also kind of like. If you try to present a product, well, it's a bit more like a pyramid. You start with the foundation and you go up. Like, how is this going to change people's lives and how they work? Uh, so, yeah, I guess it's sort of a mixture. Uh, it's like an uh, iceberg pyramid something. Um, so the way I'm going to structure this talk is a bit, you know, I want to spend some time. And this is maybe even the most important part of this presentation, like the product definition. Like, what are we trying to do here with the whole asset stuff, whatever you call it, asset browser, asset system, whatever. Um, so I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Cover a little bit the core design, like just go briefly over it. I don't want to get into too many details, whatever. Uh, integrations and I.O. I think is quite important when we talk about, you know, you have as asset markets who want to use uh, the asset system. You have how does this integrate into studio pipelines, all of that stuff. Um, I'm going to really briefly show the, the user interface. There are some cool things coming there, I think. Uh, also, not going to spend much time on that. And then sort of, OK, how is this going to develop into new workflows? Like, again, impact, how is this going to change the way we work with Blender, um, which I hope quite a lot. Uh, and then you see I'm an artist. Uh, this, we're going to look into the stars. Like, a few of the, of the things that we really want to get uh, into Blender at some point, just to, you know, why not? Let's stream a bit. OK. So product definition. Again, I'm an artist, right? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Supran. By the way, uh, Supran is also here. He's also in, in the, on the, he's mentioned as a speaker. What a like. <laughs> what a like. I've spoken. Yeah. Thank you for your contribution. But it's like. I just <laughs> kind of totally let him out in the dark, and like he doesn't even know what's coming. So uh, <laughs> that's yeah, it's gonna be fun. What are we building here? First question, right? And people keep saying this term like asset manager, right? And it keeps floating around, and people keep saying it asset manager. Okay, so let's talk a bit about asset management, at least in productions, right? Because in a production context, there's lots of stuff there. Um, this is like just like a very brief brainstorm. Like there's so much stuff. Like storage in an, in, a, in an actual studio pipeline where you have tens, hundreds of people working together on thousands and thousands of assets. Storing that stuff, managing that data can be very difficult. There are very different solutions. Now things are moving more and more online, so people don't just access one, uh, one network drive or anything. Uh, so yeah, it's, is it stored in files? Is it stored in some databases? Is it stored managed with an, like an SVN database or so, or SVN repository? You have things like editing rights, which artist is allowed to touch which file at which point in the production, right? Uh, this stuff can become very complicated also. Uh, short status, like is this actually in progress or is this maybe a locked file? And then again, people are not supposed to touch it anymore <laughs> because late in the productions, 
once something, once a file is basically ready to be rendered, do not touch it anymore. <laughs> and you don't want anything to get messed up, like especially with dependencies, right? Because it's not just one file, it's other files feeding into this and everything becomes so hugely complex. These things are difficult. You also have versioning, like version one of a character and then there's a new update on it. Some fixes in the rig here, some fixes in the shading here. So this stuff is complicated, right? Can we just solve this all in Blender for everybody, forever? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. There's definitely things that we can do there, and uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about these kind of things. But it's still, let's try to separate asset management from dealing with assets, like having access to assets in a streamlined and convenient way. So one of the, for at least for productions, one of the things that we have here is sort of, sort of a paradigm, like keep the user in control, because in productions, Again, we have all those storage systems and there are very clear rules on how things should be managed. Blender shouldn't be going and deciding how studios have to store things, right? The user or the pipeline or um, the TD, whoever is responsible for this. Um, same goes for dependency management, right? Again, all of this is production stuff. And then don't be, dis be destructive by default, which means like there are some workflows which allow you to, you know, change assets and then uh, sort of store them somewhere, right? This is, I'm going to talk a, little, a lot more about this, but this can be very dangerous if you cannot undo it, and uh, because well, you essentially cannot undo it, right? You're touching some file somewhere else, and it's not in your current session undo stack. So this is also something to keep in mind a bit, and we're going to talk about this kind of stuff as well. So at least for production context, probably for other things, there needs to be the ability at least for the user to sort of be the asset manager to take control over things or the pipeline tools, right? Um, in studios, they actually have tools for this stuff. However, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna make this easier, right? But it's, but it's something that um, we're not gonna set things in stone. We are really careful about designing something that gives studios and different uh, usage contexts enough flexibility but we can still provide these convenient features, right, that allow you to edit data and just not care about how it's stored and how things are managed, right? But this can be added on top. Oh, it's an addition and it's something that studios can op opt out. So what are we building? Okay, not an asset manager. It's functionality to help uh, you, the user and studio to use and manage assets, basically, right? Um, so we are just trying to help them getting there. So basically there are two parts of this. There's like the asset browsing UIs, which is the stuff that the user actually sees usually. And then there's sort of the back end, which is this entire asset system, which basically makes Blender able to understand what's an asset, like be able to deal with assets. So, you know, talking about product stuff, product people always like to have this one sentence that describes your product, right? That sells it and it's a nice exercise and I've kept trying to, you know, come up with something and it's also a problem, like often it's so vague, you have 10 people, you tell that to 10 people and 10 people understand something different and it's like, and I keep changing what I have there. I think I may have something that I think is okay, but ask me again in two weeks and I'm going to give you a different answer. <laughs> it's like, I would put it that way, like improve Re reusing or using and exploring 3D con content, which should be really streamlined, deeply integrated into Blender, and you know, a joy to use. Well, <laughs> enjoy. Um, so okay, let's, let's look a bit more into this, what I mean, or what are the general goals behind this. Um, in Blender, maybe in 3D in general, or in data management in general, but spe especially in Blender, Reusing tends to be so cumbersome, right? It's, we currently, we have the data block design and we have the link and depend stuff. Um, I think we could do quite a bit better here. Um, users shouldn't have to create everything from, from scratch, right? So you have this thing, you go to the Blender website, you heard about this amazing thing, Blender. It's so great, right? Everybody is doing this amazing stuff with it and you see it on Twitter. And then you go to the website, download Blender and everything's so nice and it says you're breathtaking with a heart and then you open Blender and it's a cube. Um, and 
you go and say add, right? You want to add more stuff and you see, okay, there's a torus, there's a, there's a cylinder, there's a monkey, nice, great. <laughs> but kind of Blender is, you know, it's not really that experience, right? Where you can just go and you see the stuff, the awesome stuff that people create on Twitter and you can just go, oh wow, I want to work with this. So this is also something very important for the project. To write means to explore 3D, this is really about, you know, for example, if you have, especially with, with nodes, it's super great. You can create things that people can look into. They don't have to, but if they choose to learn something about, you know, how is this specific shader done? How is this kind of geometry generated? They can actually look into the shaders, but they can also, if they are doing some tutorial or trying to get into some part of 3D, they can reuse some assets for the shading or something because they just care about the rendering or so, like they just want to see how does rendering work. So that they don't have to know each part of the 3D pipeline to be able to do something cool and learn something and explore. Streamlining asset workflows. So we've all seen the amazing add-ons that people create for Blender, right? And there are so many cool things there. So there are so many add-ons for asset browsing and asset management stuff, right? And each one of them has a different UI, a different experience. And it's like, they don't even want to do that, right? They don't want to have this, this special UI. They just they want to integrate it into Blender. They want to make the assets available to the user, right? So for me, this is also a really important part of it, like having this central hub, the central or this one design that asset services, asset markets can just use and the user just has to learn it once basically. Assets as future-proof first-class citizens in Blender. It's because, you know, Blender is not so young anymore, right? <laughs> it can easily happen that assets will feel like just an afterthought, something that was added to Blender at some point but it's not deeply integrated into Blender. That's not what I personally would want. I would I want to have assets as something that really is deeply integrated throughout Blender, something that that you work with all the time, but then again, of course, not be in the way in, in, in any way, because we do want to get go beyond the asset browser, right? Assets, you're not doing 3D because you want to create create these assets and deal with assets or whatever. You want to create cool stuff, right? You want to focus on the stuff that you create and not deal with assets and files and whatever that, whatever kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's really about, we need to develop things that people can put into their workflow and that can change the workflow of people. So again, improve and improve reusing and exploring 3D content. Streamlined, deeply integrated and, and a joy to use. Again, ask me again in two weeks and <laughs> let's see if I still would put it the same way. But I think this is pretty good, actually. Who will be our users? So the thing is, it's not really target, a target audience, right? Because we can't really choose who is going to use our, our who is going to use the asset stuff. The people just want to use it, right? They're going to open Blender and use it. But let's still think a little bit about, about this, what kind of users these are. So. Beginners and occasional users are definitely an important audience uh, that we should focus on. Um, again, it's a lot about the whole con concept of exploring 3D and using assets as a way to explore 3D, get into things, learn things. Um, there are going to be professional freelancers, so people who work on many different projects, who you know do like architecture visualization or stuff like that. So they have a very different workflow again from a production artist who they are working probably in a team, they work on a project for a long time, uh, and you know you have all the pipeline stuff going on. Technical directors, because I do think that as part of this, like as, um, because we want to make something that can be used in production, having the ability for technical directors to uh, write their own tools and scripts on top of what we have is quite important. So we are also sort of catering for them. Um, and apparently, Edward Snowden, he was tweeting about this. Uh, like, <laughs> at, some point, at some point, he was tweeting about how much he loves Blender and how amazing it is, and Ton retweeted it, and then Edward Snowden replied to it, and like, yeah, yeah, now go finish the asset browser. So, 
Okay. Is it finished? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, now why is this there? This may be one of the most important parts of this introduction to the product because it sort of comes from the, you know this exploration of what are we trying to do and who are we trying to uh, or who are going to use this thing. I found it really useful to really look at this from different angles, um, and I came up by now with those four. And like one is personal as like so the, the thing is like you talk to ten different people about asset stuff, right, and how asset stuff should work in Blender. And then you, you talk to them and they say, yeah, it's obvious, right? It's so simple, right? You just do this and this and this. And then, okay, you can spend like two hours figuring out a design for that. Then you go to the next person, talk to, to, talk to them, and then they say, yeah, it's so obvious and simple. You do this and this, and it's totally different. <laughs> <laughs> People have very different understandings of what they want from this asset system. Um, so the way that I would put this is with those four boxes, kind of. So you have your personal asset libraries. This is either somebody, um, it's probably more going in the direction of freelancers, like people who just curate their own stuff, you know, the, sort of the Beeple workflow, right? Beeple, we all know this amazing stuff that he's creating, and he just has a ginormous library of assets, and he doesn't care how they are stored, how they are managed, or whatever. He just wants to go to the content browser in, in cinema, like type in what he wants and drag it in, right? That's amazing. Um, so this is the kind of person uh, asset workflow, I would say. Then there's the context of projects again. Um, and this is, goes into all the stuff that I was saying with the pipeline stuff and all those complications and having TDs involved to fix things. Um, and for the, especially for that, I would say the keep users in charge is quite important, or the, the pipeline tools. And then there's the whole online asset service stuff. So We've been talking quite a lot to people like from Blender Kids, some of them are here, uh, uh, Andrew Peel from Pyclone, and so there are so many, you know, we have the, all those uh, add-ons who bring some kind of asset service to Blender, who integrate online asset repository browsing into Blender. And this is definitely part of um, what we're doing again. And then last but not least, this whole interactive learning thing, which is, goes quite a bit into Ton's vision of Blender 101. Um, but it's also m more than that. It's really the stuff that I was talking about already with being able to explore 3D and learn 3D without having to know everything about it, <laughs> just to get started. So yeah, this is sort of really, for me, the main guidance. And whenever we design something, this is sort of, for me, the different perspectives that I want to look at things. and. Those things shouldn't conflict and they shouldn't be too separate. They should be smoothly working with each other, right? Um, and that is quite a challenge, but I think what we have addresses that quite well. Okay, quickly, uh, I'm going to go a bit more quickly about some things. Uh, it's not an asset manager, as we already said. It's also not going to be like a local data block manager. We need better management for data within Blender, right? That, there's no question about that. But this is not this project, right? We are making some things that may help us do that, and we are finding out many things that will help us do that, but it's not what this project is about. We're also not completely rethinking data management or like data blocks in Blender, like the typical you know, objects and materials and stuff. Maybe I should put an asterisk there, or like, because there is still, there's some future proof stuff there that is maybe not so much about uh, uh, rethinking data blocks, but that I can show you a few cool things there. Um, we are also not redesigning the whole linking or, or pending. Like, this was a question like, how is gonna, how do we get data into Blender? And um, reworking that is, would be quite exploding the scope. So we're gonna keep building on that, but we are gonna enrich it a lot. Uh, that is part of the idea. Again, allow users to stay in full control. Then there's this pushing thing, right? Being able to, you know, I, I'm creating a beautiful chair and I just want to have this in my asset library, right? It's so difficult because then again we decide how are we going to store things, how are we going to manage the dependencies, uh, there is no, is there undo for this again, right? So this stuff becomes a bit complicated. So we are really trying to figure out ways to do this um, carefully so the user can stay in full control. But again, it doesn't mean that we cannot provide tools to still do it, but that is sort of on top, that is a layer on top to do this stuff. So the core design is sort of 
trying to keep the user in control and not to pushing, not to external edit editing. We have this UI design paradigm for Blender that you first operate some, on something and then you choose the settings because in other applications you often have that. You have to set up a bunch of settings, you press a button and then you get a result, right? Okay, it looks shit, let me go back, edit the settings again, press the button. Things should be really visual and I'm going to show you a bit later what I mean with that. Um, but generally, do what you want to do and then tweak it. That is sort of the idea. <coughs> Non-overlapping, non-blocking, so we're not going to do like lots of crazy pop-ups or anything like that. Um, Blender should also not freeze at any point when loading assets, that kind of stuff. The startup time shouldn't increase by, because we are loading thousands of assets or anything like that. This is sort of the thing, like don't pay for what you don't use, that I would like to bring a bit more into it because yeah, you can re really easily fill the, fill the memory with hundreds of assets and we sh Blender should be smart about figuring out what is the user actually looking at and try to get rid of everything else in memory. So there's probably going to be some garbage collection going on there. Um, integrations and I.O. Let's talk about that. I've, wait, no. Core design. Let's talk about that. So what is an asset? What's an asset? I don't know. What is an asset? Like it's, people use the term asset all the time, right? And it's just not clearly defined what it actually is. And we want to create something for assets, so got to figure it out. And I know that many other um, products, they actually avoid using the term asset nowadays, which I think is not a stupid thing, and we should probably also do it, but hey. Um, Then Ton Rosendahl came and said, an asset is a data block with meaning, right? Got it. <laughs> so, so first of all, it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's vague, right? And we, we need to be a bit more specific, or we need to get things uh, a bit more specific there. Um, what is meaning and uh, even the question, what is a data block actually? Because I think for Ton, a data block is just any kind of data that, you know, is, that Blender can understand or that somebody can understand. In the UI or in the manual or whatever, we call data blocks, the ID data blocks, like the core elements of Blender objects and materials and stuff. And, but I don't think that Ton is talking about data blocks only as in the kind of core data structures that Blender understands. Um, I'm actually pretty sure that he wants to go beyond that. So, yeah, data block, what is it? Um, then there's also all the main data in Blender is a data block. So you have all your scenes, your collections, your objects, materials, everything. Just if you open Blender, it already has like, I don't know, 30, 40 data blocks or something. And you don't want all of that to be in your asset library. So there is, um, so the idea is that you do some kind of publishing step where you say, okay, I want this to be available as an asset. Um, Currently, we have the mark as asset in Blender, which can be quite useful, but I'm not sure if it's as useful as it, or as easy to use as it should be. But definitely, an asset, an asset is an abstraction, right? It's something, you know, in the end, you just want to see a bunch of previews, some names, and you want to be able to track those things in, and maybe you get some more information about, you know, the author of this, some tags, and you want to be able to search for things. So it's really an abstraction. Um, you have this kind of stuff. Preview name, some metadata type behavior, right? Um, actually, I think the way that I would describe what an asset is, at least for Blender, is it's a package for sharing or reusing data. And you can have any kind of data in Blender, but if you actually want to reuse it for something, you package it, right? It's like with, with mail. You get an envelope or something, you put some metadata on it, like the address and stuff, and then you send it away, right? And so I, I think Looking at it as a package for sharing, reusing data is a nice way um, to think about it. Very quickly, we have this, um, this life cycle of assets, which is like you go through creating, editing, sharing, using assets. Uh, so we really try to get create and edit to be essentially the same thing, right? Um, so there is not gonna be much of a difference there. It's just regular Blender editing, um, sharing, can also be regular sharing um, or via asset markets, whatever. Using, that is quite separate again from any kind of editing or creating. And we 
really try to keep a separation between those two. Like either you're authoring assets, you're creating an asset library or something, or you're using, or you're somebody who just gets assets and you're just using assets. So those are basically in the UI different, different places where you're gonna work on things. That's sort of the idea. But there's still like, it can still be very uh, a smooth transition between them, right? But they're basically, we're separating things because you don't want to, you don't want to organize, or you, you want to use your assets where you actually want to use them, right, in the 3D view, right? You don't want to go to the asset browser to be able to get an asset or something. So it has to be really, there has to be a workflow that's really optimized for just using the assets that you need in this current context. There's this tweaking thing that we've been talking about for some days now, like being able to not just use an asset, but to make some changes and, you know, have those changes stored somewhere and you're always able to use the assets with those changes, but also get rid of the changes again. So we are thinking a little bit about this. Um, this may also go a bit into the whole generative uh, assets, like being able to drag in a geometry node tree and tweaking parameters. Um, so this tweaking, maybe that's also part of the use, or at least it's part of the workflow. Um, very briefly, asset system. Let's talk about what this is. This is sort of like the foundation for how to get assets into Blender. It's basically what makes Blender understand assets natively. Um, just some entities and functionality that work with assets in Blender. I'm gonna go quick, this is not too interesting. Um, yeah, we already covered that part. It's like, it's really just an abstraction and we have that abstraction, we get that into Blender now. Um, so, Back in the days, a long, long time ago, there was this idea, you have things, and the things are of different types, right? You have an object, you have a material, different things, right? But actually, things are getting more and more fuzzy the longer you think about it. It's like, okay, an object can be, that's a simple case, even object can be a mesh object or a curve object. Nowadays, with geometry nodes, it becomes really fuzzy because suddenly, like geometry nodes can get, just generate all kinds of geometry and, and mesh data and all kinds of things. And it doesn't really matter anymore what input type your object was. Um, but it's also like, um, for example, if you have an image, right? A texture can be a stencil texture, it can be a bump map, it can be, you know, the actual uh, diffuse color or something. Very different things that you want to use in very different contexts. Um, and how much does it matter really that data is already like Blender data, like an ID data block? Like, I think if we want to build something, future proof, I think it's more like we need a system that really handles assets as an abstraction and what data behind is behind that shouldn't matter really because again things are sort of moving to the cloud and nowadays everything is USD, right? USD is everywhere. Um, so maybe an object can be just represented by USD, right? And you drag it in and Blender some add-on or something knows how to translate this to Blender data and you get the object. It doesn't really matter anymore if it's, if you have a Blender object in your database or in your asset library, or if it's, a, uh, if it's something that's defined by USD, right? So, so the whole type stuff gets quite fuzzy. Um, so the idea is to, inst instead of trying to define like one fixed type of an asset, it's more like you describe the characteristics of an asset and give it some, some tags, like this is an object, it's a mesh, uh, it's generated by uh, geometry nodes, it can be used as a modifier in the modifier stack, right? Uh, or, um, here again, it's an image, it's not a Blender image yet, it's just, just something on the hard drive, and it's, uh, um, it's a stencil, for example, right? So you describe the type behavior in terms of characteristics, we call that traits, which is sort of like some tags that Blender automatically sets. Okay, very quickly, an asset library is basically just an entry point to some assets because you do often want to differentiate between, okay, this is the asset library for the project that I'm working on, this is the asset library uh, that I got from this online service, this is my personal things, my personal pile of things that I want to reuse for various freelancing projects, whatever. Um, so we are differentiating a bit, a bit between that. I also think you do need this all as a library because often you don't really care where it's coming from. You just want, if you just want to use a brush, well, give me the brush, why I don't care if it's from this asset library or whatever. So 
That's also important. Catalogs. Haha. -ha. This catalogs um, are the idea to be, or like they allow you to organize things in a hierarchical way without relying on this 90s concept of files and directories on disk. Like, and oftentimes, the way you want to browse things doesn't really represent the way that things are stored on the hard drive, especially like in productions, things are optimized for a certain storage and whatever. And you want to be able to just put the poses from Ellie uh, together, in, or like to even separate them into, a cat, into different things and you can browse them easily, or like merge things into something like, uh, what do we have here? You can see it here. <laughs> That's sort of good. Yeah, you just put, you get all the trees from different files and they just populate one catalog, right? So that is the idea behind catalogs, basically. There's some further stuff, like we have indexing in Blender, so Blender keeps a cache, basically, of the assets that you have, and it's quite smart. It knows which blend files changed, so it only updates the, the assets that are actually from changed blend files and stuff. There's a pending with reusing data, so if you drag in a, an object with hairy ge geometry, it's going to reuse the uh, geometry and um, same with materials. You don't want your 4K textures to fill your memory just because you dragged in the same asset 10 times, right? Um, so there is some reusing data. Um, by default, it does that. Um, the ID data blocks are natively supported, pre-rendering stuff, just some features, whatever. Um, let's talk about Blender projects, because Blender projects, you know, you have the blend file, right? And people are used to working in blend files, and they are the kind, kind of powerful, very neat things. It's basically like a database um, in, in one file. But Blender only knows about this one file at, at the time, right? It doesn't know that you're working in a project where there are 500 files, right? It doesn't know about the project structure and whatever. So there is this idea that is very related to assets, um, that there is a knowledge of Blender about this broader con context of a project. So this is actually something that I um, that I that I worked on, and you know some mockups you can see here of the kind of stuff that we could support, whatever. So we would have some project settings that are similar to uh, things look similar to the preferences, but this is project-wide settings basically. And that includes uh, the asset libraries here. So you would have asset libraries per project. Uh, and then depending on which project you're working on, you're, you can have different libraries. Um, they use linking by default. And maybe we will even forbid linking for black personal libraries. Like you wouldn't want in probably ever that your project file depends on some asset library that's just locally on your hard drive. And uh, you know, you render something that looks good and three weeks later you come back and render it again and it looks different because something on the hard drive changed somewhere else. So maybe linking is not even a feature that we want to have for personal asset libraries. At least not have it so easily available. Maybe we should hide that a little bit. Um, I should actually, oh yeah. I was, we decided that I should work on this basic Blender project support. Um, quite spontaneously, so I spent like two weeks working on that, and we have now a basic product, uh, a basic version of the Blender projects uh, in patch review, and that should go into master as an experimental feature soon. Then we can add features and enable it by default at some point. Um, asset bundles. This really goes into the ideas of not having to create everything from scratch and being able to explore 3D but also just making Blender generally more powerful. So there are like three types of bundles, I would say. So one is like demo file bundles, which we have on blender.org. Ton really wanted to have this kind of experience where you can just download a simple blend file and you can just drag things around very easily and just play with stuff, right? This is powerful, really, really, really useful. Um, very important for exploring stuff. There could be bundles for like ready to use assets, just a ready to use character or uh, materials that you drag into your scene and you can basically press F12 and use those things, right? But those are different from sort of more basic building blocks like the standard brushes that Blender would deliver or um, 
maybe base meshes that Blender could have. So like, or the the node groups, the like utility node groups for things that people using nodes do all the time. This is a different um, type of bundle for me. This is really basic building blocks. So the last one we call them sort of essentials, even though uh, maybe should come up with a better term. Um, but this can be part of Blender. So if you download Blender, it's always going to be there. And it's always going to give you some base meshes to work with, some utility node groups, maybe 300 brushes or whatever. Um, so this is really going to make the, the out-of-the-box experience of Blender much, much better and gives you much more uh, abilities. And then we want to have those ready-to-use assets um, probably on this extensions.blender.org website. That was just, there was just a blog post about this last week. Um, so there are going to be asset libraries that you can probably browse from within Blender. There's the whole Blender apps idea, which I may actually be spoiling things here a bit because there's blog post coming, but it's not yet public. So, um, But basically the idea is what if you can transform, can use the power of Blender, but to get rid of lots of things and just create a, in a really minimized version of Blender for something very specific. And this is, for example, the monkey app. Uh, Dalai will integrate like this uh, basic proof of concept for this, right? Where you can just download Blender, open it, and you basically just get this. You can drag in monkeys, you can apply materials on it, but it's super cool, right? Um, so these are Blender apps that would allow you doing these kind of things. This is a lot about learning um, uh, 3D and making 3D more accessible. Also, you can imagine for 3D printing and that kind of stuff. And then I already touched this a bit. One idea that we talked about uh, yesterday with some people about the, the Blender apps. Now, one of the things that are still a bit an open question mark about the asset system is how to manage multiple assets simultaneously that are spread over multiple blend files. And Ton, like when we talked about that with Ton, he said, well, Blender can only, should really work with the currently open blend file. Like maybe I'm going ahead. Yeah, but sorry. Cool. Uh, Please. <laughs> Blender can only really work with the currently open blend file. And that is the thing you're focused on. That's the thing you're editing. That's the thing you're saving. Um, but it would be fine if there were some TD made application that goes across all your Blender files and all your assets. And there you can reshuffle and merge and rename everything. That would be a perfect fit for like a, a Blender app. And then you have the native support for all these files still in Blender but it's a completely different experience with different rules of, of what it could do and what not. So I think yep. those two are really Absolutely. connected. I'm going to go a little bit into that, but I'm, it's actually a good point. Like the TD app is something that we really should have and then it would be super useful. Um, drafting, I already touched upon this li a little bit. This is sort of our idea. We are currently working on um, brush assets in the studio and like figuring out how the brush management workflow could be reworked. And drafting is this idea of being able to change things, have them stored, being able to reset them, but they are not really in your asset library yet. They're sort of in this drafting stage. Um, for now, it may only be for presets, so like brushes and things that you basically apply, because objects and materials is a bit more complicated, but hopefully we'll get there. Very quickly, uh, so there are going to be APIs for the asset system, internal APIs, so it can be integrated into different workflows. Um, and really it's about, yeah, you don't just have um, files there or data blocks that should be extendable. And Python API is quite important for all kinds of asset service support. <laughs> William, <laughs> you like this, right? Uh, okay, very quickly, typically you have some kind of asset service that connect to an asset database. And then with the help of an add-on or maybe, yeah, some add-on, let's say it like this, uh, Blender just can get a view into an asset database, right? It's, so all Blender has is a view on the asset. It doesn't know too much about what is in the data or wh what kind of storage is behind the database, whatever. It just knows, okay, there are previews, there are names, and it has this type characteristics. If I drag it in, this kind of code should be executed. Um, Open Asset IO, that is a pretty new project. Um, it's an open source interoperability standard for tools, blah, blah, blah you can read, right? Um, so this is a project now from the Academy, or that's, that joined the Academy Software Foundation. Did I spell that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, 
And it's basically it allows you, it's an, a standard that allows DCCs like Blender to communicate with um, asset and production management software very easily. Uh, it's a standardized API, so you could uh, have a broken that speaks to, you know, Shotgun or like um, we have the um, Watchtower or um, uh, Kitsu, this kind of stuff, yeah. Uh, for us, it's a great opportunity to add more compatibility, and we really want to support this user interface. You've kind of seen the asset browser, right? It's like nothing new here. These are some early mockups from William, uh, who's here. Um, overall, I think things are pretty much the same still, like some changes, like the catalogs. But basically, this is not really the place that's optimized for using your assets. It's the place that's maybe optimized for organizing your assets. So I'm actually, I like the idea of renaming it even to the asset organizer or something like that, because that's really uh, kind of what it's, what it's meant to do. Um, for using assets, now with the brush assets, we are exploring this idea of asset shelves, so that if you're working in the 3D view, you, have, you can access the assets that matter in the current context. So if you're sculpting, you see all your sculpt brushes there, right? Um, if you're animating, you see your pose library there, right? Um, this could also go into different editors, right? This could be in the node editor as well. Uh, this could be a standard, would be a standard UI element that you can access throughout Blender, basically, to really efficiently use assets, not to organize them or, you know, create them, to use them. Could also be this pop-up and then it's not a shelf anymore, it's a drawer then at that point, but... But this kind of, uh, this is what we're exploring currently in uh, the Blender headquarters with the uh, brush assets. Yeah, I don't have access to my videos on this computer. But this is basically, it's fine, it's not too important. This is just the uh, this super awesome demo file that uh, Simon <laughs> Thomas made. <laughs> you've seen it, you've seen it, it's on the in release notes and everything. Like it's, um, it's also in the first slide, it was in the background. Like uh, maybe I have a picture of, of it even. But this drag and drop behavior, and I think it's super important for a convenient usage experience that drag and drop works well, and that we really uh, put effort into polishing that. Yeah, it's not working at all. There we go. However, I want to go beyond that. I want to not just, you shouldn't just be able to drag something in and it snaps to surfaces and stuff like that. Um, I want to have this general placement tool, which is like, you can keep moving things around and it's going to snap to surface all the time and you can change the size, you can rotate things and, you know, it could be a general tool that's even activated automatically after you add an object or so. Physics-based. It could be physics-based, yeah. You can have, like, collision detections. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. This kind of stuff. Um, or is it even more general? Is it even asset tools? Because you could also think about scattering um, objects in the scene and, uh, again, physics tools, this kind of stuff. Um, but this is really about the operate settings workflow. So you first track something in, and you don't have to set up a bunch of um, parameters like are you going to use bounding box snapping or origin-based snapping, uh, what is going to be the scale of the object that you're going to track in, what is the up axis, like just track things in and tweak them afterwards when you can actually see them, right? So that is the idea behind placement tool and asset tools, whatever. Okay, so the the basic workflow is uh, you can use objects, materials, right? This is sort of the very basic thing. Uh, this should really work. Um, but we want to go beyond that. Assets should be everywhere. We really want to have them everywhere in the UI so it really doesn't matter anymore. Are you using local data or you can just use your assets that are just available to you? So, for example, they, are, they could be in the material selector together with your other materials, whatever. Some explorations that we are having there. We already talked about post libraries. like. Animators in the Blender Studio use post library, the post libraries all the time, and this is all the new asset-based post library. Um, you could add some features and everything, but it's super awesome. In 3.4, there are going to be node group assets, and um, basically in, you sh press Shift A, and they're going to be in your add menu, right? And we want to have the same like also for objects, and it's uh, because yeah, assets should be everywhere. There's more coming crease pencil assets. I already touched the brush assets. Um, gonna not go into too much detail. Yeah, and this is the stuff that we are working on mostly for the brush assets. Um, let's see uh, how long that will take. But we want more workflows, right? We want it to have everywhere in Blender, first class citizens. So 
that talks about media management for the VSE workflow and that kind of stuff. Um, I also want to get to work on UI presets with workspaces, matcaps, blah, blah, blah. And again, we have the whole Blender app ideas, so, idea, so there should be more of those kind of applications uh, that we need to explore. Asset pushing, I already touched that. So first we are gonna focus on the um, drafting that will sort of get us quite close to it. Um, do we still need the asset pushing? Probably, but also, why isn't there an add-on there? Like, <laughs> honestly, add-ons can do this stuff, right? Like, add-ons, I kind of want that add-ons take what we have and take it even a step further for specific workflows or stuff like that. This is, you know, totally fine. Um, but yeah, asset pushing, it is kind of important, so yeah. Um, Blender projects talked about it. Variations are also important, so. You know, you have different, it's not just different resolutions of a texture, it could also be, you know, Ellie before being beaten up by sprites and after being beaten up by sprites, right? Those are different variations of a character. Um, then being able to not use just Blender data, but also other, other data. Um, yeah, copying along external data if you have image dependencies, we need to improve things. Extensions of Blender.org will hopefully become a thing and grow and you will find many asset libraries there. Um, I kind of want to have this thing. I was saying like Blender cannot solve all the pipeline problems, right? But I kind of want Blender that to come with a pipeline, like, you know? It doesn't need to be the pipeline for everybody, but it can be a good pipeline for small studios. And this is part of what the Blender studio tries to do, right? They really work on trying to figure out how can we, in a Blender-centric workflow at least, um, what can our pipeline be? And they are sharing this and they, everything they do is open source, right? That's part of the mission of Blender and the Blender Studio as well. So maybe we can integrate quite, of, quite a bit of this as add-ons in, add into Blender. Would be cool, I think. And yeah, if you have a different pipeline, okay. Disable the add-ons. So yeah, very briefly, like look at this super ugly picture. Uh, we have those four contexts that we want to create this for. And we have a bunch of features that sort of work into these contexts. And I hope, I think what we have is quite seamlessly and you know, allows people to who are working in different contexts context to have a very optimized uh, workflow for that very optimized usability. And you know, let's have assets everywhere, right? That's kind of the idea. Not, it's first class citizens, it's not an afterthought. And again, this is, what we're kind of trying to do with this, at least for those two weeks. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.